Hello everyone, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the Analog King Air, the next aircraft in the Steam Gauge Overhaul fleet. If you're not familiar with the Steam Gauge Overhaul series, it was created by a real pilot to breathe new life into the default Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft with a total systems overhaul, focusing on primary instrumentation, radio navigation equipment, and electrical systems. All equipment featured in these aircraft are based on real-world units and are designed to meet the requirements of the most serious simmers flying under instrument flight rules or those looking for a real challenge. If you're familiar with the Analog Caravan, hopefully you've seen some of the major updates that have come out since its release, featuring the fully simulated environmental control system, some custom sounds, and the comprehensive failure system that allows you to adjust mean time between failure of nearly every system on board the aircraft or schedule specific failures to test your skills. As with the Analog Caravan, if there's one phrase I would use to describe the Analog King Air, it is attention to detail. Even though this is just a total systems overhaul and new interior model for a default aircraft, there's something that you're getting with this product that you're not with a lot of other aircraft that are available at a similar price point, and that's just the depth of systems. There is nothing in this aircraft that is not fully simulated and connected to its underlying system. Every single circuit breaker you can pull, it's connected to the integrated failure system. The attention to detail is just spectacular. Even the cockpit voice recorder needle vibrates and, and goes up the scale as you increase the noise level in the cockpit by turning on the engines. And much like the caravan, there's all sorts of little aesthetic details like the armrests or the sun visors that slide along the rail that just add so much character to this aircraft. So what I want to do today is the same thing we did with the caravan, which is to go through all the checklists required to bring the aircraft up to speed and ready for takeoff so you can see all the systems tested and demonstrated at least to a first degree. And what they say about the King Air's 24-hour checklist is that you should time yourself with an hourglass instead of a stopwatch because there's a lot to do. So let's get started. I already have the aircraft configured for engine start, but there's a couple of things I want to show you in the before engine starting checklist. And the first one is the emergency lights. This is a cool feature of the King Air. This switch over here, when you turn it on, you get this green glow underneath the panel without ever having to turn on the master switch. So you can see what you're doing in the cockpit and get prepped for engine start without having to drain the battery. The next thing is this T-handle down here which arms the automatic passenger cabin oxygen mask system, which is simulated in this aircraft. There's also these uh, quick donning oxygen masks in the overhead panel for the crew, which are also simulated with custom sounds. So now we can turn on the master switch. You can see this red LED indicator here is telling us that the cabin is unacceptably hot for passenger comfort. We can see over here, it's 93 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 degrees Celsius. Let's take a look at the battery voltage. See that it's uh, around 26 or 28 volts, plenty for a battery start today. We will check the fuel quantities. With the switch at test, we can see 1,400 pounds, the main tanks here, and the auxiliary tanks. With that, we are ready for the engine start checklist. Beacon light is on. Propeller area is clear on the right hand side. Right side engine starter and gauge. We're watching for an immediate rise of the gas generator RPM. We need to make sure this really reaches its maximum sustained value before we engage fuel flow to the engine by moving the condition lever to low idle because hot starts and hung starts are possible with this aircraft. That looks about good there. We can go to low idle, watch the ITT rise, make sure it doesn't exceed the start red line of 1090 degrees Celsius. That looks good. Temperatures and pressures are in the green. We're looking to get 50% in the NG before disabling the starter motor. And now we're just looking for everything to stabilize. The enunciators go out on the glare shield panel. Once we're satisfied with how this looks, we can turn on the right hand side generator. The enunciator light goes out. We can see there's load on the right generator. 
We can test the voltage, looks good. For a cross engine start, we can put the right hand engine condition lever to high idle, and that should be enough to run the air conditioner if we want to start cooling the cabin down. We can put the uh, cabin environmental control switch to auto, bring down the temperature, turn the fans to high, and we should start to see the temperature come down, though it is a large cabin to, uh, to start cooling down. Good. Battery amps should be reading positive, only slightly here. The battery uh, charging current is fully simulated in this aircraft, so if it's too high for too long, you'll see a battery charge enunciator here alerting you to that condition, and if you don't alleviate it soon, the battery will become fried and disconnect from the rest of the system for the duration of the flight. With that, we check the propeller area is clear on the left, and we can engage the starter motor on the left hand engine. And you really have to be careful with how long you're running the starter generator during engine start in this aircraft, because if you don't obey the limitations in the pilot's operating handbook, you will destroy the starter generator and you won't be able to use it to start the engine. That looks about good there. We can go to low idle on the left engine, watch the ITT rise. Stays below the start limit. NG's coming up. Secondary injectors. Fuel flow looks good. Above 50, we can turn off the starter. Temperatures and pressures are in the green. That looks like a good start to me. The enunciators are out. We can turn on the left-hand generator, reset, and then on. Check, and both generators show current, and the voltage is good on the left-hand generator. We could turn the right-hand engine down to low idle, but we're going to leave it at high idle to keep the air conditioner running. Next, we're going to bring the camera over here. We're going to check the isolation bus and make sure that no current is bleeding through the uh, current limiters. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the voltage on the cross-side generator and watch the load meters as we disable each generator by itself. Here's the right-hand side. We see the left-hand generator takes over the load and the voltage stays the same. Switch over to the other side. Right hand generator takes over, voltage stays the same, so the isolation bus is good. Now we can test the enunciators, and it's very important that we do test all the enunciators in this aircraft because even they can fail, and they all look good. Now we are ready for uh, the before taxi checklist. We're going to test the fire detectors. First with the right hand detector, it's good. Left hand detector is good. Right hand fire extinguisher is good. And the left extinguisher is good. And you will discover that both of these work, by the way. This is the firewall valve, which will disconnect the engine from its fuel supply and from feeding any bleed air to the aircraft. And this is to discharge the fire bottle in the engine nacelle, which will hopefully extinguish any fire that has broken out there, which will definitely come in handy when the failure system throws you a random catastrophic engine failure. It's very rare, but it can happen. Next, we'll test the gear handle warning light, which is good. I'll show you something that's not in the checklist and that you wouldn't do in the real aircraft. But as you can see, the gear handle is locked in the down position when we're on the ground, and that's the correct operation. There's a squat switch on the right-hand landing gear that keeps this latch engaged with the handle. But if that switch fails and we can't raise the gear after we take off, we might want to press the down lock release button so we can pull the handle up. And you can hear a gear configuration warning horn, so it's all working. We can test the stall warning horn. And now we'll put the gen tie switch to open. We can see two enunciators here, and if we look at the overhead panel, we can see that the generators are not supplying much current anymore, but the battery is supplying a lot of the current for the triple fed bus. And we can check that the battery voltage and the center bus are the same.
we can put the gen tie switch back to normal. We should see those lights extinguish and the current come back up on the generators. Next, we can move the bus sense switch to test, which will affect the same thing by simulating a bus fault. And we can see here that uh, we get the same thing up here. Check the voltage in the triple fed bus. We can reset the bus fault. The lights go out, triple fed bus voltage stays the same. Bleed air valves to open and we can check over here the pneumatic pressure is being regulated to 15 psi. We could set the uh, temperature and climate control system now, we already have. The duct temperature is good and cold, it's trying to cool down the aircraft. We're now down to a uh, chilly 65 degrees. Vent blower to auto, now that the cabin is cooled down. Electric heater is off. Cabin master we can turn on. Cabin accessories will leave off. Gyro suction is in the green. Now the AC inverters. AC power is simulated in this aircraft. You can see we have 400 hertz here and the enunciators go off on the glare shield. Weather radar should be in standby before we turn on the avionics master to protect the ground crew. And when we turn on the avionics master, watch some of the needles here on the panel to see just how much they look like a, a real thing rather than a simulated facsimile. Remote compass is slaved and aligned. If we were experiencing a magnetic anomaly, we could operate it in directional gyro mode, but for today we will leave it automatically slaved to magnetic heading. Flight instruments are set. We can set the altimeter both in uh, millibars and in inches of mercury and test it. Flight controls are free and correct to my joystick here. Annunciators consider, only very few left on, looks good. Instrument flags, consider, looks like just the navigation flags on the left side and on the right side. Exterior lights as required, parking brake, release, and brakes test. We will skip forward now to the 24-hour run-up checklist. Nose gear is centered, parking brake is set. Electric trim, we can actuate with the switch on the yoke here and see that it's working. Electric trim switch cycle, we're looking for the indication on the uh, pedestal enunciator panel there. We can turn on the yaw damper, get the indications, cycle the rudder boost, and then turn on the autopilot master switch. We can see the uh, two autopilot master indications here and dead reckoning mode because no other mode is currently selected. We can come onto the yoke and Disable the autopilot, we hear the tone, and confirm that the autopilot is now deactivated. Next, we'll test the inertial separators for the two PT-6 engines by switching the actuator mode to standby and turning both of them on. You can hear the motor in the background as the vanes in the inertial separator move into the full on position. It takes about 20 to 30 seconds, and then we'll see the green indications here on the enunciator panel when they're fully in position. There's one, there's the other one. Now we can turn them off with the main actuators. We hear a different sound, and the lights go out. Next, we'll test the auto ignition system. Turn the auto ignition to arm, and we're going to go to low idle just for a moment and increase the power levers until we see about 17% torque. And what we're looking for is for the auto ignition and the low prop pitch indicators to go out at about the same time. Now we can reduce the power levers back to idle. We should see the lights come back on. They look good. The auto ignition is working. Now we're going to do a primary propeller governor overspeed check. Now it says to do each of these individually, but I only have one throttle over here, so we're just gonna do them together. 
we're going to increase the power levers through 1600 RPM while holding the primary governor test switch. And we should see the propeller RPM held to 1600 RPM until we release the switch and they'll jump up. Now we're going to test the ground idle stop solenoid on the propeller governor. So we hold the switch to test and then cycle the propeller levers to low RPM. And as you can see, the prop RPM is held into the green arc around 1500 RPM. You can go back to full and now pull the power levers to idle and we should see the same thing. And then when I release the test switch, we should see the white prop pitch indicator lights go out and then come back on when the RPM drops below 1300. And they're working, great. Next we're going to test the auto feather system, which is custom coded for this aircraft so it matches uh, hopefully what's in the real world. We can put the switch to test, we see the light extinguish, and now we're going to advance both power levers to around 25% torque. And as we do so, we should see the green auto feather enunciator lights uh, light up on underneath the ITT gauge. Now we will slowly reduce the power levers on one side until we see that around 17% torque, the cross side AFX light extinguishes, and then at 10%, we can see the propeller go into feather and the auto feather light extinguishes. Now it won't go fully feather because the engine is still running. As soon as the prop RPM gets low, the torque goes up, brings it out of feather. So it just goes into this little cycle here, but we can see that it's working trying to pull the engine into feather. We can go back up to around 25% torque on that engine, and then we'll do the same thing on the other side. Slowly reduce the right hand power lever, 17%. We should see the auto feather disable on the cross side, 10%. And the propeller goes into feather and begins to cycle. The last step of the auto feather test is to pull the other engine down into idle to make sure that this one unfeathers and that both of them return to their ground idle RPM. Next we're going to test the windshield anti-ice. So we take a look at the load meters up in here, we can see they're just above 30%. And when we turn on the windshield anti-ice, we should see an increase, and we do. That means that it's working. Next, we test the propeller de-ice, this switch here. We can see the prop de-ice needle jumps up to around 20 amps over here. It says we should have 26 to 32, that's good enough. We should see an increase in the load meters as well, we definitely do. And the next thing we're looking for is for the prop amp needle to cycle down to zero and then back up to 25. And that's about on a 90 second interval. And that's because both engines are not de-icing their propellers at the same time. So the coils on the propeller have time to cool down. Now it takes 90 seconds over so the sake of the video. We'll skip that for now and assume that it's working. We'll move on now to the surface de-ice. What we're looking for here is a fluctuation of the pneumatic pressure over here when we go to activate the single cycle. And we're gonna see an enunciator here, look for the pneumatic pressure fluctuation, there it is. And now what we're waiting for is for it to complete the cycle. It's not actually de-icing the whole aircraft at once, it's pressurizing the boots first on the wings and then the tail. So it takes a few seconds to complete the cycle. Then when we move the switch to manual, we should see about twice the fluctuation in the pneumatic pressure because it's activating all the zones of the aircraft at once instead of cycling them. That's exactly what we see. So both modes are working. Next, we're gonna test the custom coded pressurization controller here by putting it to 1000 feet below field elevation and moving the cabin pressure switch to test we should see a decrease in the cabin pressurization altitude 
meaning that it is working and the bleed air is working. We can reset this to pressurize and about 6,000 feet for after takeoff. Next we're going to check that the bleed air is uh, working for both valves. We can turn off the left one, we should still have pneumatic pressure here. Turn off the right valve, we lose pressure. Turn the left on, pressure comes back up, we know that both are working. Flaps, as required, we'll test them here, make sure the indication is working. Looks good to me. Fuel quantities we can check again. As we can see, there's actually more fuel in the main tanks than there was last time we checked, and less in the auxiliary. And that's because anytime the engines are running or the electric standby pumps are running, there's two jet pumps automatically transferring fuel from the auxiliary tanks into the main tanks. Flight instruments, check. Battery ammeter should now be very close to zero, so we don't uh, overcurrent the battery when we go to takeoff. And with that, we are ready for takeoff. So I will leave the video there for today, I think, and before we go, I will just show you the failure system. The weather radar does work, by the way. So you can see the engine indications here showing you the health of the engines. You can repair them, refill the oxygen cylinder, and here is the failure system where you can adjust the global failure rate for the random failures and also see the currently active failures adjust the mean time between failure of nearly every system on board the aircraft or disable the failure completely if you want to do so. You can also schedule failures to occur randomly between two times to test your skills on something specific. There's much more information on how the failure system works in the version 1.1 video of the Analog Caravan if you're interested in that. I will also do another video of the King Air in flight to show you all of the custom avionics, do some navigation, and show you the various radio configurations that are available in this aircraft from almost any era of its history. Until then, I wish you all blue skies, and I will see you in the next video.